We have the uh, chair of the House Public Health and Human Services Committee, Mr. Jonathan Springer. Springer, come on up, sir. Singer, of course. Springer, singer, singer. Thank you. Well, thank you. I, I wonder what you thought about that, um, about Commissioner Conway's comments about mental health and sort of the dynamics of network adequacy there in, in telehealth. No, I, I, I appreciate the question, and also thanks to, to our two previous uh, folks, our Attorney General and our Insurance Commissioner, uh, were amazing and very tough acts to follow. Uh, but, and thank you for hosting this, too. I mean, I think it is so important that we have these tough, candid conversations because these are not easy problems to solve. Thank you. I, think, I think the most important thing that we can do is, is not lose the forest through the trees right now and understand why we're pushing for these things. Uh, we can talk about the big numbers, uh, but fundamentally, what this is about is life and death. Fundamentally, and, and I, you know, I, I was talking with my cohort, uh, the chair of the other health committee, uh, Susan Lantine, a minute before uh, I went up, and she said, well, well, Jonathan, you're the funny guy, say something funny, and I'm like, well, no pressure now. And so I'm, I'm gonna go with something a little more serious, actually. And so 2012, I'm out there knocking on doors for my first election, and I run into an old high school classmate of mine. And uh, we hadn't talked for about a decade. And so as we're talking, I said, okay, you know, it's really great. What do you think you would like to see me work on as if I'm elected? And she goes, I know you're in the state legislature, but we need to make sure Affordable Health Care Act stays in place. And I go, wow, that's really, you know, powerful. Why? And she goes, well, after I got my first job and I started working in a child care center, I, I got pancreatic cancer. Hmm. And the prognosis was not good. And I went to the Mayo Clinic, and they were able to offer me this procedure, but my health insurance wouldn't cover it. And ultimately, my parents liquidated their nest egg so I could live. Now, we talk about criminal justice reform, uh, but this, in my mind, is, is, a, is a bureaucratic mugging that's happening right now. Your money or your life. Your money or your child's life. If we can't figure this out, mm -hmm. Whether it's health care, whether it's mental health care, um, we passed a bill this year to make sure that there's parity in the cost in co-payments between physical health and mental health, which should have always been there and, and technically has been there for a long time. These issues, whether it's physical or mental health, we can't separate them, and we need to figure out that this is, this is a human-focused issue to begin with. And that's why you're seeing the politically charged elements in our Democratic primary and even, you know, four years ago in our Republican primary focused on this issue. You see poll after poll after poll, people say, what is your number one most, most important issue? They're not talking about the Middle East. They're not talking even about impeachment. It's health care. It's appropriate that you sort of uh, take me out of the technical telehealth, mental health, back up to sort of more principled view. We were talking beforehand about this uh, human experience that you just went through. I, that's useful, I think, for people to hear about your job as a legislator and how sometimes it's a little different than people imagine. Why don't you just tell us what you were doing before you got here? Sure, um, so um, right before this actually, you know, I had a constituent who has a self-insured plan. Uh, if anyone knows anything about that afterwards, I'm gonna come find you or you come find me actually, because I'm, I'm learning a bunch right now. And uh, she was diagnosed with breast cancer and she uh, was told by her uh, insurance, okay, go get an opinion, go talk to a radiational oncologist. They offered a certain kind of therapy that the Mayo Clinic approved. The costs are the same um, as the traditional therapies that would be provide, provided here in Colorado. The difference being it's actually less risky um, to choose what the Mayo Clinic was doing and also um, the same cost and, and a better outcome in all likelihood. Um, she's being denied this coverage. And we have been what I call running uphill on a hill with mud and jello to get through the bureaucracy of figuring out, okay, who is responsible, not only for the denial, but reversing this denial. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't go to Commissioner Mike Conway on something like this. This is a federal issue because it's a self-insured plan. We're looking at ERISA issues. And, and this woman is, is a nurse. She works in the healthcare field. She takes care of people with cancer. If she's struggling with this and I'm struggling with this, what does that mean for the average citizen? Yeah. So you had said also when we were talking that you were uh, on the Bernie left before Bernie became Bernie. 
Um, not that he, you know, you preceded him in office, but that he sort of took hold here recently, uh, four years ago, and, uh, but, and you, your liberalism precedes that. Um, what do you make of, as a Democrat, as a leader on healthcare in the state, what do you make of the state of the Democratic nomination process and how healthcare is infused in all of that? Is there, can you make sense of some of that? If you've ever seen that infographic that just looks like a mushroom cloud, oh no, uh, I, 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 think, I, I think actually um, it, it's been very interesting to see how each candidate is really being pressed to not only have a health care plan, but very specific elements and specific goals within that. And um, you see this huge dynamic. And so I'm actually really excited to see this wide field because um, like Commissioner Conway said, if there was just one idea that fixed this problem, we would have done it already. Yeah. And, and so I'm, I'm really thrilled that, you know, I, I haven't picked a winner in this race yet, but, you know, Senator Sanders has his Medicare for All plan. Uh, you know, I know that Elizabeth Warren is working on something. Kamala Harris just came out with a plan that looks very similar to what Germany has been doing for a long time. And, and so I think that, you know, what you're seeing now is people putting real ideas on the table. And, and I'll tell you, my biggest fear is that ideology is going to get in the way of having a thoughtful, robust conversation or, or that, you know, Unfortunately, money and politics will get in the way of having that thoughtful, robust yeah. conversation. But we're, we're, we're in a good place right now, I think, in terms of getting the ideas out there. How would you characterize this last session, the 2019 session, compared to other sessions that were not as uh, favorable for Democrats? So if you've seen this uh, infographic that looks like a mushroom cloud now. Uh, <laughs> so it was fast and furious this year. I mean, I think that uh, what you saw was uh, a, a Democratic majority that was uh, very excited to do a lot of things that had been held up um, in Senate committees and died in Senate committees in previous years, and, and the floodgates opened. Um, that being said, the vast majority of the bills, 90% of the legislation, including the health care legislation that we did, and one, by one account, we had at least 138 pieces of legislation that somehow touched on health care. Um, were uh, bipartisan bills. And so uh, I think there was a real intentionality behind find, finding ways to uh, cross that partisan divide. And I think bringing in those rural perspectives was really critical to that because mm -hmm. I'll talk to my Republican colleagues uh, and, and they will tell me, uh, especially our rural Republican colleagues, they feel ignored by their own party uh, when it comes to rural issues, including health care. Uh, there are so few uh, even rural Republicans in the legislature that bringing them to the table has been a, a unique and exciting perspective that you've already talked about it in terms of telehealth, we're working on mobile crisis units, mm -hmm. um, really finding new ways to address uh, the, the health and mental health issues that we're seeing. Give us a little insight to the extent that it's reasonable and appropriate uh, into caucus dynamics with a, a number of new members. Uh, are they chomping at the bit and are they forcing the caucus maybe to go more quickly, quickly than may have happened even five or six years ago? Well, you know, it's funny. So uh, I'm thinking about Representative Kyle Mullica right now who ran a, a vaccination bill. And uh, this was not the bill that it was made out to be in terms of mandating that every child get vaccines, but really encouraging best public health standards. And, uh, you know, as soon as he was elected, he came to me and said, Jonathan, I want to run this bill. And I'm like, Kyle, you are a freshman and my job is to haze you. You are hazing yourself right now. <laughs> um, and um, they are courageous. They care about this stuff. Um, Representative Caraveo is, is a family doc. Representative Mullica is, is a nurse. Um, you see uh, people who um, have been on the ground and have either personally experienced something through their own health care uh, issues um, are survivors of cancer or uh, people who are healthcare practitioners that are sick of a bureaucracy that isn't helping them do their best job. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very optimistic in my last year at the state legislature next year that we are gonna be well served by people who are knowledgeable and passionate. How would you grade uh, Governor Polis's first term, first session as governor? Well, so he was just up in my district this morning with a $1.3 million grant, so I would say A+. Plus. No, um, so, um, no I, I think that, you know, I'll, I'll say the biggest difference, and before I give a grade, the biggest difference between his, his office and Governor Hickenlooper's office is, you know, uh, Governor Polis was a legislator before this. He understands the legislative process. He loves it. Um, he's much more active 
And so when I'm running a bill and I know that um, you know, there's something that's going to run afoul of something, I know I can reach out right away and say something. And also, I'll know when I've crossed a line pretty quickly as well. And I'll get a phone call, and we'll have a conversation, and we'll work something out. Mm -hmm. So on that level, you know, I would say you know, uh, in his first year, um, it's an A minus. If this was his last year, I'd give him probably a B minus. But uh, to get his sea legs under him and to get the administration set up the way he has has, uh, has been really hopeful. And insurance, I mean, the rate of insurance increases are going down in Colorado. Yeah. I, mean, the, uh, I don't have to give a grade. We can talk about actual, um, actual market metrics here. Yeah. Uh, what should people expect out of the 2020 legislative session? Fewer bills, more yelling. Um, it's an, it, <laughs> It's an election year. Um, yeah. I think there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of uh, business that, that was left undone from last year, believe it or not. <clears throat> uh, but uh, it, it is going to be a political year, so you're going to see more of those sort of speeches and diatribes. Um, at the same point, I think a lot of the fine tuning that we're going to need to do, whether it is, um, you know, on surprise billing, whether it is on actually funding a uh, program that will look at other ways to provide universal health care to the state of Colorado. Um, I think you'll see those. And probably the biggest thing that we haven't really talked a whole lot about, um, even though Attorney General Weiser was here, is we have a great program. Well, we have a program that does a pretty big job of providing health care and housing people in Colorado. It's called our criminal justice system. And the, and the, and the left and the right, it's sad, true, and funny. Um, but the left and the right are coming together on this one, and this is what's pretty exciting, is you see um, your um, Koch family, right-wing, anti-tax folks going, why does 90% of the people in the Alamosa County Jail have an opioid problem? They should be, if they're in a jail, they, we should be dealing with criminal justice issues. And you've got left-wing folks like me that are going, look, there's better ways to take care of people overall. And you're seeing this meeting of the minds, and we'll see new legislation this year on housing, healthcare, transportation, um, that all look at that nexus, yeah. which is a hard thing to do because we know that prevention, you know, ounce of prevention, you know, really is worth more than a pound of cure. Being a citizen legislator, legislator has a bunch of upside in terms of service and honor, and it's a grind, I'm sure, in terms of you know, managing home and family and career and legislative duties and constituent responsibilities. When, last question, when they get to this period in uh, the history books of Colorado and they talk about the, what's happened over the last period of time and they get to Jonathan Singer, what would you like them to say about you? Ah, it's a good question. Um... Not guilty. No, um, I, I think, I think um, you know, if, if, if they could say, you know, he, he listened, uh, he worked hard, and uh, he did everything, you know, he could to represent his district and also serve the people of Colorado to the best of his ability. It's not a headline, but I, I, or an epitaph, I hope. Um, but but I, I do hope that people understand that our, our legislators, either both sides of the aisle, folks, really care about this. There are so few people in there for ulterior motives. They're doing this because they love it. No one takes a $40,000 a year job where you start at 6 o'clock in the morning. You sometimes end at midnight or 2 or 4 o'clock in the morning, and you're right back at it the next day. And it's not a 120-day session. It's more like a 300-day session. Um, and it, folks really care about stuff. And if, if people could realize um, that element of this, I think we'd get a lot more done. Chairman Jonathan Singer of the House uh, Mental, Public Health and Human Services Committee. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Let's Thanks. give him a round of applause. Thank you. Good stuff.